Today, I'm gonna talk kind of from my unique perspective. If you're out raising money and you talk to 10 different people, you are gonna get 10 different ideas. And really you as the founder or the CEO need to sort through all that and figure out what makes the most amount of sense to you. If you try to say, gee, person eight told me this and I'm just gonna follow them, but it doesn't seem natural to me, you're probably gonna stumble. Um, so this is my really unique perspective. And this is June. Hi, June. Hello, everyone. Hey, June. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> June is the matriarch of, this, of the startup community here in Spokane. Mm -hmm. Everybody okay. loves June. Thank you. It took 10 years, but it worked. <laughs> and we have a lunch for you and, and seats. Um, so this is my unique perspective. Now, I want to qualify the comments I'm going to make. My comments are targeted toward people who are really first time entrepreneurs. They're first time out raising money. If you are Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos, my views are not going to apply to you because just based on who you are, you could probably raise a billion dollars tomorrow on any terms that you want. Now, and those are the stories that we all hear. We all want to be those people, but you have to start. And the advice I give, this is tailored to first time entrepreneurs and really tailored to get your financing done. You may not maximize the terms, but get your financing done. And if you're a first time entrepreneur, frankly, that's what's most important. Get those dollars on the door, in the door and get started. So I kind of just want to caveat my comments for that. Um, and one other caveat as well too. Oh, my comments also have no reference to, the qual to what your company does. I'm starting with the premise that you have a reasonable idea, a reasonable market, and a reasonable team. And I really fully believe that kind of with what I'm saying, if you have all of those sort of things, uh, you should be able to get your, your financing done. Now I'm gonna break it up into four different categories. How much to raise, how to structure, how to set evaluation, and what process to follow. And, and maybe kind of spend 10 minutes on each. And I've kind of got some prepared thoughts here, so um, don't uh, 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 knock me down for kind of reading from notes here. And I'm gonna hand this out at the end, but I don't want to do it in advance, because like I said earlier, everyone will just go to the punchline. Um, so first of all, how much to raise? Um, I always believe at a minimum, you ought to raise sufficient amount of capital to get you through 18 months with some amount of cushion. Don't assume everything goes right. Assumes you have some delays, things take a little bit longer, but it will get you through 18 months. And hopefully by the end of that 18 months, you have um, some meaningful milestone that will enable you either not to have to raise more money because your cash flow break even, or you can demonstrate that you've, you've, you've got your product out on the market, you have your first customer, you've generated revenues, and with those milestones, then you can go out and raise more capital. So I say a, a minimum of 18 months. Now, that's gonna be a little bit qualified by, if you are a first time investor, and you think, gee, to get it through 18 months, I'm gonna need five million, you might wanna step back, because if you are a first time entrepreneur here in the Spokane, Coeur d'Alene and Sandpoint area, and you don't have a background of startups, raising $5 million might be tough. So I'm gonna caveat that by, it's gotta be a reasonable number. And what's reasonable? I don't know, 250, 500, 750, a million and a half, something like that. Um, unless there's something in your background of what you've done that really telegraphs to people, man, you're on to something. David now is starting a company. He's raising three to three and a half million, but he's got kind of a unique background in the industry for which he's starting his new company, uh, which in my opinion, gives him the credibility to perhaps raise a little bit more than what, I, what I'm initially saying. Um, I also believe you ought to structure your financing in, a rate, in, in terms of a range, rather than go out and say, I need to raise, uh, uh, you know, $750,000 or a million dollars. Um, I always like to put it in the context of a raise. Because I like every, because people like me look at things that entrepreneurs do and say, were you successful or you're not? Did you hit your goal? Did you not hit your goal? So if I go out there and say, I need to raise $875,000 and I come in at, you know, 870, I've kind of failed. So I always tell people, put it in the context of a range. And in my example, 
when I said 875, I might say, I'm looking to raise 750 to a million dollars. And that way, if you come in somewhere in that range or close to it, you had a successful financing. Um, and you know, you can, you can all, and maybe in the back of your mind, you'd like to raise more, but I find that too many people, particularly in effervescent market environments, go out with too high of an ask and they come in less and it's kind of deemed a failure. Why not go out and kind of suggest a range or the lower end of the range and be so successful that, hey, I'm about to raise 750 to a million bucks. You know what, I closed at 1.1 million. That just shows momentum, shows success. And, and so I try to, when I'm deeply involved in the financing, try to do that where at the end, I come out and raise a little bit more than I thought. And again, you're just, you, 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 you come out, um, 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 you come out looking like a, a very successful fundraise and you're off to a good start. Lastly, I always do advocate that whatever fundraising you do, if at the end you've got some people who are raising their hand and say, hey, I want to put in another 50 or 100 grand or something like that, and you've already reached your maximum, take it. Just take it. Now that's within a, that's within a relevant range. If you're looking to raise a million and all of a sudden you've got interest for two or three million, well, that's, that's probably too far. But if you're raising a million and, and you've got someone that wants to put in another 250, just take it. I have never, ever, ever seen a company that took a little bit more in the financing and really ever regretted it. Now, I've seen companies that said, gee, if I only would have taken that another 250, it would have given me six months worth of runway, and when that recession hit, or that product was late, or that customer delayed, I would have had more runway. So that, that's kind of my, my advice on, on, on how much you ought to raise. I will pause there to see if there's any feedback or, or, or questions on, right. on that. Uh, how much, so we talk about 18 months of runway. Let's say that they know they're going to do another round. When do they start fundraising again? That's, that, that's, 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 I was going to bring that up. Um, financings take anywhere between three to six months. If you get it done in three months, you're lucky. If you get it done in six months, you know, you're, 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 that's kind of uh, par for the course. So thank you for bringing that up. I, I meant to address that. Um, if, so you, for this 18 months, after 12 months, you got to start fundraising again. And fundraising is a huge distraction. It takes a lot of time. And so again, uh, back to my uh, 18 months, if you only raise for six months, you know what? You have to start fundraising immediately again. And, and, and fundraising really can be such a distraction that it really does uh, inhibit the growth of the company if you just spend too much time fundraising. So to that point of fundraising being a distraction, I worked on like a tech startup type thing that ended up not working out, but throughout the process, we had VC scouts that would constantly reach out to chat. And there's just kind of that duality of, do you want to have those connections or should you just stay focused and deal with it when you get there? I want to hear your- Well, maintain the connect. If you're getting inbound interest from VCs, that's terrific. Or if you happen to bump into a VC in an elevator or someplace, you know, take the contact, uh, give the elevator pitch, write their name down, um, generate enthusiasm, but tell them, you know, we're not raising money for six months. Um, now, if they're overly aggressive and say, we just love your company, we we'll love your space, you know what, listen to them. Um, but uh, if you don't necessarily need money right then, just, I mean, that's, that's just an ideal situation because you're building your backlog of contacts to approach when you are raising money. And in, in most VCs, and I know uh, myself as an angel investor, I like to be able to kind of watch, monitor, get to know a company before I have a gun to my head to invest. So to the extent that you know, I, uh, I bump into you somewhere and I learn about you and you're telling me you're not raising money for six months, that's kind of ideal. Because I'll say, hey, you know, give me your plan for the year. And I'll come back in six months and see how you've done. Um, uh, so, you know, again, if anybody's interested, take their name and, and develop a relationship. But, you know, VCs almost kind of like it uh, when you say, hey, we're not raising money right now. We will later on because, you know, they, um, um, uh, th there is a kind of a temptation just to uh, uh, jump into deals when they're hot. And when you tell them that they can't have a chance, they almost want it more. And these are all my opinions. <laughs> Anything else on that, on how much to raise? Okay, next we're gonna move into uh, how should I structure my financing? And this, this is probably, you know, the next two points are things where I really have a lot of passion. Um, 
I say if you are, again, a first-time entrepreneur who hasn't raised money in kind of our region here, you ought to make the terms and the structure of your financing as straightforward, as general, as common as you possibly can. Because what you want to do when you go out and talk to investors and you've got your financing package, you want them to look at it and say, ah, oh, that makes sense, got it. The structure makes sense, the valuation makes sense. Okay, now tell me about your business, your team, your plan, and your technology. Because I know myself, one of the first things I look at when I get a plan, um, quickly try to get an idea what the company does, go look at the team to see what their backgrounds are, and then go look at the financing. And if the financing is some crazy sort of structure with some wild valuation, I'll go, Andrew, hey, sounds great. You know, let's talk in six months. Um, Cause I don't really want to work through the brain damage of trying to be one of the first people to go through and say, Andy, Andrew, your terms suck. You shouldn't be doing that. Um, what you really want to do is have people say, okay, that makes sense. Now I want to learn more about the company. And so get them to focus on the business and not really initially get hung up on the terms. Now, the next thing is if when I talk about plain vanilla or generic, um, um, structure your financing at an early stage as a series seed preferred stock financing. It is generic, it's plain vanilla, the term sheet and all the documents come right online. And what I hand out later, will show you the website where you can get this. Because VCs and angels, they don't, you know, um, um, we prefer a, 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 a series seed preferred stock financing over a convertible note, over a safe instrument. Now, I know those things exist. In hot markets, we see a lot of safes and you might be able to get away with doing it. But if you want to <coughs> maximize your probability of getting your money in the door in a three to six month time frame, just have it be something that all sophisticated investors are gonna say, yep, get it, that makes sense. Thomas, um, does it make sense to do a quick explanation of these other sure. What, yep. what a safe note is. Good, and, good. And just so you, everyone has a framework. Perfect, thank you. Um, the three instruments I talk about are convertible preferred stock. And essentially, it's just equity in your company. Um, you're probably familiar with common stock, which is just shares in your business. Common stock is common because it just doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles associated with it. Convertible preferred stock has some, it's called preferred stock because it has some, the investors get some preferences. They get some rights, maybe a board seat. They might have some preferences on a liquidation. And, um, and some of the things in there are negotiable, but there's certain preferences that all investors kind of want to have. Um, then there's a convertible note where um, uh, an investor group might lend you money in a note that has a maturity of maybe 12 or 18 or 24 months, has an interest rate, maybe five, six, seven or 8%, but then it is convertible into the next round that is presumably a qualified financing of some amount, maybe by sophisticated institutional investors at a discount to that price, maybe 20%, maybe 25%. Um, as an investor, I don't, prefer that because it basically I'm paying you today for tomorrow's valuation at some discount and I prefer just let's just set the price today let's all get in and aligned and know what the terms are and what the price is um, that's my preference because um, it's simple a convertible note has another problem associated with it you might get to the maturity date you know you haven't quite raised around and you know, the market conditions have changed and all of a sudden you do another convertible note and two years later you just have this crazy structure with three notes and different conversion rates and then someone might me looks at it and says just looks like a lot of brain damage um, the other thing is a safe um, i really don't like safes because safes are basically just a it's not it's a little bit more than a handshake i mean it is a contract but it basically says hey give me some money and in the future we will uh, convert that um, um, into the next instrument at some discount, but there's no maturity date. There's no promise to you as a banker well, would hate this. There's, there's no promise to pay it back. It just, it just gets converted in the future. And the other problem with the safe, 
and again, this is all coming from my perspective, <laughs> at least a convertible note and series, the series C preferred stock, there's a common document that all the investors sign. We're all kind of in on the same terms. Generally, someone might have a side letter, but that doesn't happen very often. Safes are all this individual, like someone might raise a million dollars in a safe, and let's say from 10 people, all at 100 grand, but my safe might look different from your safe, from your safe, and your safe. And unless I ask the question, hey, are all the terms the same? I don't really know. And I've seen some horror stories <laughs> where other investors were not aware of the little bells and whistles that some investors got. So those are the reasons why I don't like safes or convertible notes and some of the distinctions between the two. Um, I, investors also prefer C-Corps. Um, you know, there's LLCs and S-Corps and all that. And there's some uh, company specific reasons why those are favorable because of the flow through taxation. But venture funds don't really need that. We're just looking for capital gains. And as an investor, um, um, an LLC or a uh, S Corp requires a K1. For whatever reason, emerging companies forget or delay to do the K1s. I've got to follow them to my partners. And it's just, again, it's just messy. I mean, all of these things can kind of be dealt with. But again, I'm looking through the lens. I want to help you get your financing done, get your money in the door as efficiently and as quickly as possible. Comments on structure? Yeah. Quick question. When you talk about preferred rights under that structure, yeah. when you talk about preferred, ret excuse me, preferred returns, is that, I wonder what the appetite is for an investor who might say, listen, you know, I, I, I get my money back first and then sponsor as a clawback so we have more upside. What are your thoughts? You know, the, 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 the preferred return, um, 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 I'm being very careful here because Rick knows more about this than I do. So I'm, I'm, I'm going, Rick's going, wow, what is this guy saying? Um, the, the, the real preferred return comes in the context of a liquidation preference. Um, and a, a series C preferred stock upon a liquidity event, um, I have a choice of getting my money back, for, either getting my, just my money back first or converting into common. And then if, 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 if the liquidation preference is, is higher than the price per share, I will convert and I will act as a common shareholder and get the, the full upside. But in a low exit return, my preferred return is really just getting my money back. Now, another element might be where you tell investors that before the common shareholders get anything, they not only get their money back, but they get something you know, that, that's not necessarily baked in there very frequently. It might be baked in there in the context of a dividend that is included, but that's only kind of if approved by the board and accrued and all that. But I've seen very few, few deals where there's a guaranteed preferred return of 5%, 8%, or 10% before the common shareholders get anything. Um, the only real place where that comes in the context is the liquidation preference, where I have a right to get my money back first. I've just seen some deals, you know, especially in real estate. Where real estate, might, that's common. Yeah, you might start off with an 80-20 split in, yep. in favor of the uh, the limited investors. Yep. And then once they hit a 20% IRR or something like that, or whatever coupon it is. If, I, if we try to do the real estate model in venture capital, we'd have a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and founders who uh, would be uh, upset. Because um, the real estate model just has all sorts of you know fees and returns and all that sort of stuff, and a lot of that cuteness doesn't exist in um, a Series C preferred stock. <laughs> Good question, though. Yeah, Tom, you mentioned the C corp. The do you prefer those to be Delaware C corps? That's where I turn to someone like Rick. That that gets a little bit the outside of my pay grade. Uh, I know there's pros and cons to. To Delaware and Washington. Do you want to take that one, Rick? Or? Sure, yeah. The short answer is, who are you raising money from? If you're raising money locally and, and you can you can grow your business with just local money, then a, a local Washington C Corp is, is perfectly appropriate. If you need to go outside this region, outside of Washington State, and your institutional investors are not familiar with Washington law, they're going to demand Delaware. So if you know to grow your company, you're going to need outside money down the road, you might as well just do a Delaware C Corp up front. Great, Actually, I wasn't necessarily aware of that. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Yes? I'm curious, how many, maybe you can answer this as well. Um, I have a lot of people from the entrepreneur's side of things who say, start an S-Corp, it's, it's low cost, it's easy to administer. And then you're talking about like K-1s, right? From the investor side, a C-Corp is more preferable. From a founder's side, it's more work, right? 
right? So if I need to change from a Washington T or S Corp to a Delaware one, is it a headache? Is it just filing some forms? Like how easy is it to shape shift? So mm -hmm. we're getting in the weeds, but it depends on the nature of the business. Yep. So an S Corp makes sense for a service oriented business. It is toxic if, if, if you're holding assets because the, like you, you never want to put real estate in an S Corp. You put real estate in an LLC, the LLC can have the waterfall provisions to give people preferred returns, but you never you never put real estate in an S Corp. You're asking for a tax tip. Oh, that's okay. So it just depends on the nature of your business. <laughs> and again, you're mo mo so if you're a dentist, if you're a dentist, right. then an S Corp might make sense. If you're a chiropractor, if you're some kind of service business, yeah. S Corp makes sense. But if you're in a business that's going to be a tech company, you might as well do it via C Corp because that's what your investors are going to want. hard tech, like patents and all this kind of stuff. But C Corp, C Corp. Really cool. <coughs> yeah, but, you know, again, my distinction is if you're raising money from sophisticated investors, they're going to strongly want, prefer, recommend a C Corp. And and um, and again, again, my, I'm looking at this through the lens of putting your financing together in a way that um, is uh, um, most acceptable to angel and VC investors. Any other questions on that topic? Okay, next we'll move into valuation, um, which you know, again, you you ask uh, ten different people, and you're going to get ten different ideas, and. Um, you know, uh, valuation is really, really tricky because there's not there's not a hard and set formula, um, and it's it's really it's way more of an art than it is a science. Um, those who see a lot of deals um, kind of have um, the framework of a very informal Zillow because like because uh, I, I see so many deals, I just kind of know that a company at this stage with this founder group. In this industry, with this gro with this um, growth projection and these margins, based on my informal real estate Zillow in my mind, I can kind of say, "Boy, this 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 range kind of feels right." But the average first-time entrepreneur doesn't really have that. So I always suggest, you know, go out do go out and do your research. You know, talk to people, see what others say. But one thing I say is only really solicit valuation advice from people that um, are either potential investors, they're active investors, perhaps they ideally they've taken money from investors, someone that is really in the know, someone that has seen a lot of transactions and, and ideally is a likely investor. Because what I hear all the time, and because I'm always the bad guy when it comes to valuation discussions, <laughs> people will come to me and we'll talk about valuation. And I will kindly and thoughtfully and constructively uh, and graciously <laughs> maybe pick a different number. Uh, but no matter how nice and diplomatically I try to do it, they'll go, hey, Tom, got you know my next door neighbor, my buddy, my bowling partner, he says the company's worth 50 million. And you're telling me this? And I go, oh. Well, is these people ready to write a check? Oh no, they don't. They don't. They don't touch this stuff. It's way too risky for them. But they're adamant it's worth fifty million. Now you go talk to someone that has maybe made ten angel investments, or actively invests, or has accepted capital from somebody. Um, they're going to give you probably a more educated uh, sort of valuation opinion. So that's what I suggest that you do. Um, and I, I have one kind of interesting perspective because I've seen capital formation as an agent. I was an investment banker for 10 years. As an investor, I was a VC for 10 years. And as an entrepreneur, with the, the company Etails that I started, we took outside capital. So I've seen it from all perspectives. I've made over 100 investments. I know the upside and downside of, 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 of taking money in a premium valuation. And you want valuation thinking from um, someone that has similar experience, because that's gonna be the most valued as opposed to your next door neighbor or your tennis partner or something. Um, once you have had all this chatter and have developed this range, I suggest you pick the midpoint of the range. Maybe take the midpoint and add 10% or something. It's just something that is, you know, again, when a sophisticated investor sees your valuation, they'll go, okay, yep, that makes sense. Uh, and then they'll focus on your business. Um, rather than try to say, you know what, 
the top end of the range, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna go for that because I wanna minimize my dilution. The problem, you might get it. I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna necessarily discourage you from doing that, but just realize the, the negatives are, it might take you six or nine months to get your funding done. Um, um, you may not get it done. Um, you may have to end up kind of going back to the midpoint of the range. Uh, and the one thing that is really bad is if your fundraising takes too long, it develops a stench, um, it gets a little stale, people like me talk to each other and they go, hey, you know, Joe's been out there for a nine months raising money and yeah, he's how he's real struggling. You, you know, probably re, should have reset the valuation. Then finally, Joe wakes up and goes, got it, okay, I'm gonna go out and change the valuation. But it's kind of like when you see the house on the corner that's been on the market for a year, and all of a sudden someone says, Sl press, slice, pr Slash. Price slashed? Price um, slashed. You go, well, uh, maybe something's wrong with this thing. Again, I'm setting it up. And, and even if you pick the midpoint of the range and you go out, it doesn't mean that you get so much interest. People <laughs> love your deal so much. You're subscribed three times and you go, God, I just have all the interest. I'm, I'm bumping it up to you know 40% over the midpoint. It preserves the option to increase the valuation, but it's just your starting point to get, to get the discussions going. And really for a first time, entrepreneur when you send your deck out your real goal is not to sell them right when you send it out just get that first meeting just get that first meeting have the chance to look at a sophisticated investor on a zoom on a call or face to face and if you set too high of a valuation you may not get that meeting and it may take you too long to um, get your fundraising done now uh, I kind of have another uh, um, I also think you ought to select a valuation um, that you can look a prospective investor in the eye. Think of your mother, your yeah. best friend, a widow, an orphan, and, and look, <laughs> and, and look at me to look them in the eye and say, you know what? If you invest at this price, I'm highly confident I can give you a rate of return that's commensurate with the risk that you're taking. And I, I, I like that in uh, an entrepreneur, because I want entrepreneurs, frankly, to worry every night about me making money for them. You know what, I've raised, uh, I've raised money for 10 different businesses that I've co-founded, and I worry all the time about getting their money back. Um, and I want, I want someone to really believe, this is not just you know, funny money, it's not just a game. You know what, I want someone who really believes, uh, has kind of the, the, the um, the value system where they realize, you know, this is high risk and it may, it may, you know, it may go sideways, but you know, if I hit reasonably close to my plan, I can look you in the eye and say, I'm going to get you a rate of return. And angel investors kind of want to get 10 X their money. And a lot of angel investors will kind of look at your plan, cut it in half, um, look out five years, um, you cut your you know, income in half and multiply it by 10 and, and see whether or not the company could be sold for that amount. Um, so, that's kind of just another a more subjective thing. Um, the other thing too is um, be mindful of the downside of raising capital at a premium valuation. Again, a first time entrepreneur has never been through a down round or never had the board take them out and shoot them in the head and <laughs> fire them. Um, and I, I kind of the analogy I make is if, uh, if I go buy just kind of an, you know, an, an average car, just a Chevy, but I pay three times the market value for that car, and that car, the blinker doesn't work on day one, or there's a little flaw in the fabric, I'm gonna run down to the dealership and say, Andrew, fix this now, okay? Now, if I buy the same Chevy and I get it for, you know, market price or 10% below, I'm gonna be a little more, you know, uh, understanding. And investors are that way too. Okay, you know what? I just paid up for your valuation. <laughs> You're gonna perform. You are gonna perform. And if you don't, there's gonna be consequences. I'm being a little dramatic here, but, and then once you, but if you have to get to the scenario where you have a down round and you have a down round either because the market's corrected like they have now, or because you're late on delivery of your product or the dogs aren't eating the dog food, it's ugly. And I raised money last time at 10 million. We're coming down now. We're putting more money in at a 
$3 million valuation. And it's, you just, so this be, and, and I, I tell this story to first time entrepreneurs and they, they, they nod, they've talked to 10 other people on the one person whose advice they don't take. And then they have a down round. They go, man, this is painful. I remember when you talked about it, I didn't think it was going to happen to me though. Cause you know, on, cause one good thing about entrepreneurs, they, 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 they do have so much conviction and belief in what they're going to do that sometimes it's difficult for them to sit back and say, I wonder if everything doesn't work out right. Mm -hmm. So that's my preaching on valuation. Rick, can we play, play point counterpoint? Well, no, I think it, it'd be great if you would flesh out a little about why a down round is so painful. Like the end result is the, the entrepreneur loses that much more ownership of the business, right? Yep, yep. Um, yeah, it's just more dilution. I mean, if you know, you might uh, be able to get a premium valuation on day one, not dilute yourself so much. But if there's a down round, the down round is probably going to, you know, just if if, if if the pendulum swing swing this far for the the, the premium valuation, it's going to go that way in a down round, and um, the, the risk of that is less if again you kind of you know picks. If your starting point, your evaluation was somewhere kind of, you know, in the midpoint. Just one thing that maybe you can I don't raise. mean to keep looking at you. I'm not. No, I know. I, I'm staring at you. I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, maybe pre-money, post-money. Yeah. Something about that for people. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, that, a, that can be a huge thing depending on the amount of Do people capital understand pre-money and post-money? Okay, let's say that um, you have just started a new business and someone like me comes and says, okay, your business is worth a million dollars. That's the pre-money valuation, the pre-money valuation. Then let's say uh, I'm going to invest half a million dollars in your business. Now the business is worth 1.5 million. That's the post-money valuation. And, 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 and the, the valuation of the company has just gone up by a half a million by the amount of my investment, because we said it's worth a million dollars. I just throw $500,000 on top of it. Well, now it's worth a million and a half. And then that, that implies if it was worth a million and now it's worth a million and a half and I put in a half a million, I own one third of the company. And thank you for bringing that up. So to me, a, it's, it can be big it's just something. Because you just, if you don't know, you don't know and investors surely help you do it in a certain way compared to how you probably want to do it. <laughs> yeah. And if you dilute before the round closes pre-money or post-money, in this case, it could have a major impact on your dilution. So. Yep, yep. Thank you. Because yeah, I, 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 I just always kind of assume people understand yeah. that. I yeah. tend to gloss over it. So you just mentioned diluting pre-money versus post-money. Mm -hmm. You want to dilute. I mean, obviously, so. you'd want to. I would want to dilute for, well pre because you're not including your capital into your dilution. And in, in, in the language of yeah, financing. But word it too. Yeah, the language of finance, when you go out and say my company's worth a million dollars, generally, almost always, that's in the context of a pre-money valuation. You say, my because my, my money, my company's worth a million, I value my company a million dollars. Then how much you raise, if you raise a half a million, the post is a million and a half. You raise 250, the post is a million two. So it's kind of hard to, you know, it's unusual to preference it in the context of a post-money valuation because you don't necessarily know what you're going to raise. Gotcha. That's the thing. There's tools like Carta, things like that, where you can build cap tables and build scenarios out where you can go through these raises with your team so everyone understands how they're going to be diluted in different situations. You know, we've only done one round and we, we learned a ton kind of on the fly. So it was nice. it would be nicer to have had some of these scenarios figured out beforehand. Yep. Another question with the length of the rounds and how you, let's say we're raising a million dollars and we're not going to make it there. Are there, uh, like, do investors make claims that say, we will not give you the money unless you hit your round? Or is it typically fill it up as much as you can? And Very then... insightful question. And, I, and um, I'm going to kind of hit on that in the next section, but I'm going to bring it up now is um, Sophisticated investors will typically say, let's say you're raising a half a million. And a, 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 a sophisticated investor might say, or most typically would say, tell you what, I'll, I'll put in $100,000, but it is predicated on you raising the full 500,000. And I will not either release the funds from ESCO or provide my check until you have the full $500,000 raised. Because if, if I give you, if you, if you and I meet and you say you're raising a half a million and I give you a hundred grand and you go deposit it, I'm not only taking the business risk, I'm also taking added financial risk that you don't raise the balance 
and all of a sudden, in a couple of months, you're out of money. Now, I've unfortunately seen less sophisticated angel investors get burned by that because the founder or the fundraiser uh, says, oh, hey, here, you know, here's the documents, give me the check. Um, and they're probably not advised by someone as uh, capable as Rick. And that money uh, gets uh, 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 deposited and the less sophisticated angel investor doesn't even know. Um, so um, um, I always recommend that companies say I'm raising X amount and not really take that money until they have the full amount. Now there's exceptions to that. I mean, if you are in full transparency, telling the person that, hey, I'm, I'm cashing your check and we're doing what's called a rolling close, um, you know, uh, as long as you're upfront and everyone's okay with it, it's fine. I typically don't like that because I'm taking additional financial risk. Okay, so follow up on that. If you are waiting until you fill the full round, as a founder, uh, would you recommend having the investor <coughs> in the escrow rather than you're, keeping you're, the check just so they can Good. That, that, that's check. that's kind of my my oh, next sorry, my ahead. next I section where I talk about process, <laughs> but I'm going to answer your question now. What um, in the various things I've raised money for, I've had situations, and I've done it both ways. But what I recommend is if an individual investor says yes give them a subscription agreement immediately, have them sign it, take their check and put it in an escrow. Okay. Uh, that way you have it and they can't change their mind. What I've seen before is, and, I, and I've, I've, I've been guilty of this myself, where someone says I'm in and I go, great, I'm gonna get back to you in a couple of weeks when we do our closing. And then um, something happens, the market crashes, um, uh, people go through a divorce, uh, someone gets sick, a uh, kid's college education comes up. Uh, they talk to someone who says it's a stupid idea and they change their mind and they call me up and say, hey, Tom, you know, uh, I know I said I'm in, but I've, I've, I've changed my mind. My but wife, My wife found out. My wife found out. That happens, no, that happens a lot. That ha no, that's another one, my wife found out. Or I, I hear, hey, don't tell my wife. Um, that's why often, oftentimes the documents now require a wife's or a spouse's signature yeah, right. on it. Um, so, but I, I recommend when, when, when the iron's hot and they say yes, get them as locked in as possible. But I stop short of actually cashing their check because I'm mindful of, I don't, you know, I'm mindful of them experiencing the added financial risk. And it goes back to your earlier point on asking for a range because yes. if, it, if the range is a million or if, the, if your original target's one, one million and you get to 800, uh-oh, I mean, you're almost there. Yep. But now are you kind of stuck where if you have that range, right. you're already moving. Yep. Insightful questions. Yeah, very good. Um, so my, ne my next kind of, my next uh, bucket of uh, comments on, on what process should I follow? And um, you know what I might do is kind of hand some of these around because I kind of have a cheat sheet here. And the last section has a lot of bullet points on there. And we're running out of time, so I want to make sure people have them. Um, you know, of course, you know, start off with a comprehensive set of documents, including an investment pitch, detailed projections, term sheet, cap table. You know, I think to the extent that you can uh, reference that you have a board, uh, uh, that, that adds credibility at an early stage. I think if you can reference some advisors, I often tell people that, hey, if they're working with Rick Rep, have an advisor page in your deck. Show that Rick's working with you. Uh, let's say you're working with one of the accounting firms here in town, put that in here. If you're working with U.S. Bank, put that in there. Because the more credible, at a very early stage again, that's what I'm referring to, at a very early stage, if I go, hey, you know what? These guys are surrounded by people like Sonia, Sana, and Rick, and others. I go, that's added credibility. Um, you know, I did that when I raised money for green cupboards and e-tails. I put together, because it was just me and a student and an idea and nothing else. But we put together a board of directors that included some very successful business people here in town. I put advisors in there just to make this to make just to make this very early stage idea look more credible. Um, so put together a comprehensive set of documents. Now, one thing I have in here, which I can go both ways on, um, I would recommend kind of a plain vanilla term sheet and evaluation. That way you don't play the game of, well, you know, uh, what valuation do you think it should be? And particularly if you're going out to angel investors who don't really like to get their hands dirty in setting a valuation. Um, um, now, if you're going to a venture community, maybe you play the game a little bit, 
But you know, quite frankly, for early stage companies, many, many may, may not be going to venture funds. But I think the more comprehensive set of documents, um, to me, you know, one thing I say about when I look at companies, um, when I ask a due diligence question, the answer to the question is less, is less important than how you answered the question. And when I see someone is coming to me with really a set of documents for me to review as a potential investor, it telegraphs to me, this group is researched, they're thorough, they know what they're doing. Guess what? They probably behave that way in other aspects of building the company. How they build a team, how they talk to customers, how they develop a product. They're thorough, they're precise, they know their audience. So really, this information is what I want to see, but it telegraphs a signal to me that people, these, these, these are, these, they, they, they know what they're doing, even though they may not. And one thing that's really important when you're talking to investors is be big at the net. You know, come across as, hey, I know what I'm doing. I, I know how to raise money. I know how to build a business. I know what to put into my, um, my, my pitch deck. Um, set a reasonable minimum. I always say, you know, if you're out raising, let's say, let's just pick a number, you're out raising a half a million dollars. You know, tell people that your minimums are maybe a half a million, 50,000 to 100,000. Um, the very first fund I raised, I was gonna have a $25,000 minimum. And some very wise person came to me and said, Tom, if anybody can do 25, they can probably do 50. And, you'll, you, and you'll, you, you can spend then half the time raising money. That was the best piece of advice because nobody came to me when I went out and raised that fund and said, hey, can I do 25? So, but, but my one caveat is set a minimum, maybe 50 or 100,000, but tell them also, hey, but I can be flexible. You know, for certain investors that I find to be really strategic and value added, I can be flexible, and that's what I do. Because you don't really want to lose them, but you don't want them coming in at ten or ten or ten thousand or five thousand. Because I will tell you, the amount of pain of an investor is inversely correlated to the amount of money they invest. If you are out raising a half a million dollars and one person writes a half a million dollar check, you probably won't hear. Well, I'm not going to say that. You'll likely hear more from the person that put in ten grand. Um, <laughs> Also, start your financing, secure initial commitments from, from, uh, from founders, friend, friends, family, and other friendlies. Because ideally, if let's say you're getting your raise in half a million, you want to be able to go out and say, hey, you know what, I'm raising half a million and I've got X amount raised. And X amount can be 50 grand or 100 grand, but at least you show you've gotten started. Um, and, and that you're, 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 you have some momentum. Because it is kind of hard. I mean, when I say, how much have you raised? And they go, hey, I'm just getting started. I don't have anything. Again, it you, you, doesn't mean you can't get it done. And again, I, I'm trying to build a structure for you and a process that optimizes your chance of getting this financing done quickly. And if when you start and you've already got a handful of commitments from you know, an uncle, your bowling partner, or someone, it just shows momentum. Um, then, and once you have that, then develop a, a, a list of prospective investors. You know, angel investors, seed funds, anybody. And the longer the list is better. I'm not gonna say that any number is a wrong number, but the more names, the better. Yeah, I, you know, at a minimum, maybe 25. And in the context of doing that, because a lot of people in the room here and others may not know 25 individual investors. That's where you leverage a local, the angel investor network, um, like the Spokane Angel Alliance, or you leverage your legal counsel, like Rick, or your banker, or any other advisors, or any other board members, or anybody else that's part of your team. And if you have five advisors, or you're probably going to get at least you know five names from each of them. So, but begin to put together that list of people, and then um, and then and then set a closing date. And I'd say set a closing date. The earliest would maybe be three months out maybe four months out um, and say, you know, we're gonna close by then. And then you're off to the races. You, you've set your terms, you have your documents, you have your list, you have your early founders, and now email, call, meet uh, with, these, with these people. And, and every day, add more names to the list and then just rinse and repeat. And just keep calling and talking to people and meeting with people until you get a yes or a no. 
a yes or a no. And then when you think you kind of, you know what? Hey man, I can see it. I've, I've got, I've got, you know, three quarters of it committed. Um, I got some fence centers out there. Um, then you just go out and say, Hey, guess what? Got momentum and then put a closing date out there and then just go out there and tell everybody you're closing on this date. And then people go, wow, there's momentum here. And the fence sitters, you know, quickly then either come in or fall off the fence. Um, and then I think we talked about, oh, then also incorporate feedback. As you're talking to prospective investors, there might be some common feedback you get. And generally, I would say if you're hearing something regularly, you know what, unless you're adamant that what you're doing is the right way to do it, incorporate the feedback. Because um, your, your pitch will get better, your presentation will get better. You'll learn more from your pitches, uh, from, your, from your meetings, and incorporate that in your, your presentation. Um, we talked about uh, the subscription agreement and getting that when people say yes. Uh, we talked about avoid rolling closes. Um, and then close your financing and get started. Now, one odd feeling you're gonna find is um, once you close your financing and you have the money in the bank, you're gonna look at it and go, I just spent six months working on it. And, and you're, you're gonna find it to be an odd dynamic to actually start allocating the funds to hire people and market and develop products. So that's all I got. Questions? Oh, I, I just want to say one thing too. I, I, I've been intentionally been a little cut and dry and black and white and maybe uh, um, uh, a, a little silly. But one thing I find is, you know, I just try to be, try to put something out there uh, that is kind of clear and concise, really just to invoke a constructive dialogue about, hey, can we do it a little differently? And, and these aren't just hard and refined rules, but hopefully just something that gives you some real skeleton of how to get started. Yes. You mentioned at the end there that uh, you know after you get funded you're going to hire people. What do you do about set asides for equity for <laughs> management? What's the typical thing? Good, good question. I, I meant to incorporate that as well. I typically like to start my my pre money cap table with a 20% equity pool. So if I say my, my pre-money valuation is a million dollars, just to pick a round number, that means 20% of that has been allocated toward the future hires. And so you're talking about you're giving away that, or setting aside the 20% pre-dilution. Pre. Now that will be diluted by the financing, yeah. maybe down to 15% or something. And um, you know we could we could negotiate all day long. You know maybe it ought to be pre or post, or should it be 15 or 25%? But if I were just to pick something out, I'd say the pre-money cap table has a 20% reserve for uh, options for new hires. And again, you'll get 10 different answers on that, but that's, that's I think, is something is um, a good starting point. And then is that aside founder equity and then whatever else you want to allocate to investors? It was really two groups. I mean, in, in my million dollar example, 800,000 is founders for the founders to allocate whatever they think is appropriate. And the 20% is um, for, uh, uh, future employees. Now, what really sophisticated investors will do is they'll sit down and say, "Okay, Tom, um, uh, give me or give me a plan for your hiring for the next 18 months, and and how much do you tend to allocate, and is that reserve sufficient, or or maybe even longer than 18 months?" Hmm. But in, but but to, but to your question, incorporating something in there in that pre-money cap table is important. So thanks for bringing it up. Do you ever go back when you get a no, like if you're getting close to the closing date and you're not quite there, you have to go above people know and you pretty much stay away from that. Well, see, I, that, that's where the art comes in. I, I, I try to kind of, uh, um, if you pick something out there that's, uh, when you first start fundraising, putting something out there that, you know, three months might be too fast, but four months, in four months you should kind of, if you follow everything here, in four months you ought to kind of know. But that's, but that's four months prospectively. Now, when I kind of at the threshold where I, 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 can, I can see it and I can feel it, but it's not there, that's when I go out and I'll, I'll put a hard date in the sand. And, and maybe, I'm, maybe I'm before that four month date, maybe, I'm a, maybe I've slipped a couple of weeks, but just kind of going out there and, and, and saying, here's the date um, is, is a forcing function. But it, it's a bit of a gamble. You wanna make sure you're there because if you miss it, 
Um, then you got some crow to eat, but that's again why I like the range as well, because that gives me a safety zone in there. I'm looking to raise 750 to a million one, and I want to do it in four months, and I feel like I'm close. We're going to close in 30 days. There's enough vagary in there that no matter how you ultimately close, presumably <coughs> you're within those con confines. But it, it's it's an art. Yeah. And 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 it's kind of it's kind of it's creating a little bit of an auction environment and a sense of urgency and jump on this train or you're going to miss without really saying those words because the day someone comes to me and says hey Tom you have to decide by Thursday I'm out I just don't invest that way.